Chapter 3 Italy in Africa Sometimes history lies not in archives or libraries, but beneath our feet. Tourists exiting the central train station in Rome spill out into the Piazza dei Cinquecento, the P Plaza of the 500. Travelers distracted by taxis and touts are unlikely to give the name much thought. Those who do assume that is, it is yet another prideful nod to Italy's place in the Renaissance, the 1500s, an abbreviated form of the Cinco Cento. Auto exhausts, auto enthusiasts could be forgiven if they guessed that it referred to the Fiat Cinco Cento, an economy car signaled the post-war automotive Renaissance of Fiat. But the correct answer has nothing to do with cars or the Renaissance. The 500 in question are soldiers who died in the first great military disaster of Italy's African adventure. They fell in combat at a place called Dogali. The road to Dogali was prepared by a decaying Ottoman Empire, Empire abhors a vacuum. The largely coastal territory west of the Red Sea between Djibouti and Sudan came under Turkish imperial rule following the conquest of Suleiman I in the 16th century. Ottoman rule endured for nearly 300 years. The appointment of Ismail Pasha as Khedive, or Viceroy, of Egypt in 1867 opened a critical phase in the history of Egypt. Ismail modeled his vision of Egypt on the European powers of his day. He rebuilt Cairo on the model of Paris under Louis Napoleon. He endowed it with a great opera house and commissioned Giuseppe Verdi to create a new opera, Aida, to debut there. Meanwhile, the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 had dramatically changed the significance of the Red Sea coast. It also inspired Ismail to undertake a program of imperial expansion at the expense of Egypt's African neighbors to the south, Sudan and Ethiopia. The Nile originates in Ethiopia and flows through Sudan before reaching Egypt. Ismail's moves would consolidate Egypt's control of the Nile and the Great Red Sea waterway that now, thanks to Suez, linked Europe with Asia. Egypt would become the dominant regional power Egypt moved into Sudan, establishing a presence at Darfur in 1874. In Ethiopia, Egypt occupied the trade hub of Harar in 1875 before being stopped by Ethiopian forces at Gura in 1876 and Sahati in 1883. The Khedive's version Vision of a European-style Egypt, complete with colo colonies, a modern capital, and a grand opera house, exceeded his resources. By 1878, European creditors, anxious for their investments, forced the Gedive to appoint Europeans to key positions in his government. Ismail Pasha's authority faded. The rapid decline of Egypt in the 1870s and 1880s created an opening not only along the Red Sea coast but also in the interior, especially in Sudan, where it coincided with the rise of a millen millenarian Islamist movement known as Mahdism. Muhammad Ahmad hailed as the Mahdi the promised one who would wage war against the enemies of Islam, 
had successfully mobilized Muslim resentment of Western rule. In this case, Western rule was represented by British administrators in Egyptian Sudan. The Mahdi's preaching, along with his demonstrable piety and zeal, served to rally numerous believers who, in 1881, followed the Mahdi's lead and moved against Anglo-Egyptian garrisons and positions. The British colonel William Hicks was given command of an Egyptian force and sent against the Mahdists. Hicks and his men were destroyed in November 1883, as was a force sent to rescue Khartoum under General Charles Gordon. With the rapidity that suggested divine favor, the Mahdi and his followers found themselves in control of Western Sudan. Britain needed friends. In 1883, Britain sent Admiral Sir William Hewitt to Ethiopia. Hewitt's mission was to recruit Ethiopia, situated on the Madis' eastern flank as they pushed northward as a check on the forces of the Mahdi. Hewitt met with Ethiopian Emperor Johannes at Adwa, a commercial crossroads town and political capital in the Ethiopian north. Hewitt found Johannes open to persuasion. Johannes's motives were complex. He was a sincere and devout Christian and feared Mahdist influence in Ethiopia. In 1880, Johannes had issued a proclamation that invited Ethiopian Muslims to either convert to Christianity or leave. He was also worried about his northern frontier with Egypt and Sudan, and he was concerned about a northern outlet to the sea at Masawa, not only for the export of Ethiopian goods, but also for the import of firearms. Alexander Malcolm Mason was an American Civil War ve veteran who had refashioned himself as an Egyptian civil servant. Mason was a mere 25 years old in 1865, but he felt unprepared to return to civilian life in the United States. He decided to look abroad and offered his services to Egypt as a consultant an expert in strategic and military matters. As an employee of Egypt in the 1870s, Mason helped train Egyptian troops. He also traveled hundreds of miles in Egypt and Sudan, surveying and drilling in search of water. By the 1880s, he had tired of field work. He settled into a desk job as Bay, or resident representative, at Masawa. Masawa was a hub in a trading network of ivory, gold, pearl slaves, ostrich feathers, and civet. Caravan trade reached not only the Ethiopian highlands, but across Sudan toward Western Africa. Via boat, goods crossed the Red Sea to India, Arabia, and the Middle East. Masawa was critically important to Ethiopian trade and, in fact, was claimed by Ethiopia. At one point, Johannes tried bluff and bluster to make good on his claim to Masawa. I must send down my troops, but Mason responded with mockery. Masawa was the trade hub that belonged to Ethiopia, no more than it belonged to any of the countries whose markets it served. Ethiopia could have access to Masawa and its markets, but it would not own it. Mason joined Johannes and Hewitt in signing the Hewitt Treaty at Adwa in June of 1884. By the terms of the Hewitt Treaty, Johannes would apply military pressure on the Mahdists with an aim to facilitate the withdrawal of the troops of His Highness the Khedive from Imperial 
positions held by British and Egyptian forces. The British, in turn, recognized Ethiopia's territorial claim to Bogos on its northern periphery. Crucially, Mason and the English guaranteed, quote, free transit to and from Abyssinia of all goods, unquote, through the Red Sea port of Massawa, then under Anglo-Egyptian control. Almost immediately, there were misunderstandings. In late July, the merchant merchant ship Karsika unloaded 50 crates of firearms destined for Johannes at Masawa. Customs clearance was denied. The ink on the Hewa Treaty was barely dry, yet some 800 rifles remained, sealed in their shipping crates at Masawa. Alula, Johannes's lieutenant, protested via letter to Mason. Three months later, in October 1883, Johannes was still writing angry letters, protesting the violation of the treaty. Quote, I am keeping the treaty. I have not broken it. It is a disgrace to break a treaty. Unquote. He promised to send troops against Ahmadi to fulfill his treaty obligations, but the promise contained a veiled threat that his troops just might march all the way to Masawa. Egypt wavers. Italy moves in. The corvette Gabrielli shuddered to a halt along the dock at Masawa. As the sun set on the 5th of February 1885, the Garibaldi and a companion vessel, the Amedeo, disgorged an Italian force of 800 men. As the Egyptians had never evacuated, Masawa, the city remained at least nominally under Egyptian authority. That evening, the Italian flag went up alongside the Egyptian flag at the governor's palace. The display announced a period of transition from Egyptian to Italian rule. A proclamation to the people of Masawa promised peace and good order from an Italian government that claimed the friendship of, quote, of England of Turkey and Egypt, no less than that of Abyssinia. Italy Italy was inspired by Napier's mission against Tedros in the 1860s, but also by King Leopold of Belgium, who since the the late 1870s had been establishing a personal colonial empire in the Congo. For King Umberto of Italy, the example of Leopold was apt, for it showed that even small nations can accomplish great things. Of course, it was a precedent not lost on the Ethiopians, who were eager to avoid the fate of the Congo. Leopoldo Traversi set up a scientific station let at Let Marf. Marafia and Shoa on behalf of the Italian Geographic Society. Two scientific missions in the Stanley Mold, one led by the by Giuseppe Giulietti in 1881, and another led by Gustavo Bianchi in 1883, had ended in disaster. Both parties were massacred on the climb to the Ethiopian highlands from the coast. Although the massacres were not carried out by an Ethiopians out on Ethiopian soil, they occurred on routes normally accorded protection by authority of the Ethiopian emperor. These massacres had an empathic intent, namely to discourage such exploratory voyages, which inevitably led to larger and more permanent incursions. They set the price for Ethiopian encroachment at a level that was despairingly, unacceptably high. In the Italian case, they failed to have a deterrent effect. The massacres of the Giuletti expedition in 1881 and the Bianchi mission in 1883 served as pretexts. The security of Italian persons and Italian interests, a security the Ethiopians were manifestly unwilling to provide, 
became the justification for Italian occupation. It also established a pattern whereby each setback, there would be others, provided an occasion to move bulky Italian political leadership along toward a deeper engagement and telegraphed correspondence with Italian ambassadorial representatives in Constantinople in January 1885, Pascal Santislao Manzini, the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, emphasized security concerns. Quote, the massacre of the Bianchi expedition, unquote, he wrote, quote, added to that of the Gioletti expedition, has obliged us to strengthen on our authority and affirm our prestige by sending a garrison, unquote. In the following days, the Italians prepared the transition from Egyptian rule to Italian rule at Masawa. Pushing into the highlands, Johannes was livid. The Hewitt Treaty, negotiated only months earlier, allowed free transit of goods, including arms, through Masawa. In the eyes of Johannes, it was an arrangement that implicitly recognized Ethiopia's historical claim to Masawa. At the time of the treaty, Ethiopia allowed Masawa to remain in Egyptian hands, with the understanding that if Egypt departed, the port would revert to Ethiopian rule. However, well-placed Egyptian British agents believed that Ethiopia simply couldn't be trusted with a Red Sea port of such strategic significance as Masawa. In fact, following the completion of the Suez Canal in 18. 18- 69, any major port on the Red Sea became a matter of preoccupation. During the scramble for Africa, unoccupied territory generated anxiety that it would be occupied by a rival. In this case, an unattended Masawa might be added to Djibouti as part of France's Red Sea presence. The possibility of Egyptian withdrawal from Masawa created an opening for Italy. If the Egyptians were incapable, the Ottomans unwilling, and the Ethiopians untrustworthy, perhaps the Italians could serve. While the Italians were not exactly British proxies, they were happily tolerated as placekeepers. If the Italians occupied Masawa, the French could not. Augustus Wilde, who had represented Britain in the Red Sea region, called British conduct toward Ethiopia and Johannes a vile, quote, bit of treachery. England, he confessed, made use of Johannes as long as he was of any service, and then threw him over to the tender mercies of Italy. Johannes was displeased when Italy occupied Masawa, but he was a realist. He was not ready to move against Masawa, let alone occupy it. In discussions with an Italian representative, Johannes stipulated that he would tolerate the Italian occupation of Masawa, provided that the Italian presence went no further. It was an idle promise. Italy's presence in 1885 was barely a toehold. The Italians controlled less than four square miles, a fifth of the area of Manhattan. In late 1886 and early 1887, the Italians pushed toward Ethiopian highlands, creating a fortified position at Sahati. In response, Johannes's intrepid commander Alula led repeated attacks on Sahati on January 25th. It was a classic colonial confrontation, lightly armed Africans attacking entrenched colonial defenders. The results were predictable. Hundreds of Alula soldiers were maimed and killed by artillery fire. Italian casualties were virtually nil. Fortunes changed abruptly. The following morning, Colonel Tommaso de Cristoforis led a column of 540 
Italians and 50 native soldiers to reinforce Sahati. Alula was anxious to avoid a repeat of the tragedy of the previous day, so when he learned that Italian reinforcements were on their way, he resolved to intercept them before they could reach the safety of the fortifications at Sahati. Alula chose his terrain well. About two-thirds of the way from Masawa to Sahati, the route which follows a dry creek bed passes between an undulating hills. The hillsides are dotted with shrubs, providing a natural camouflage. Alula ordered some of his men to take cover on either side of the Italian route, consuming the remainder of his 5,000 among the natural features of the hills. When the leading edge of the Italian column came within range, Alula's men rained down an, a devastating convergent fire from the hillsides. Italian infantry saw little more than puffs of smoke. At the rear of the column, Doug Christophorus heard the gunfire, but he did not halt his men until a few hundred feet further on he realized that he was facing a much larger force. By then, withdrawal was not an option. Here are the two pictures in the book. Here are the Alula soldiers dressed in, um, they have like shields and uh, there's um, like on their head is like lion's mane. And here is the battle that is described. De Cristoforis and his forces sought the advantage of a nearby hill, which gave them a commanding view, but the summit was too small for them to deploy fully. They formed a compact target and soon found themselves encircled. With the Italians outnumbered 10 to 1, the outcome was never in doubt. According to Alola's chronicler, for Alula and his men, the anger rush, the eager rush of combat was Quote, like a bridegroom going to the wedding. Unquote. As the Italians fell wounded, Alula's forces closed with rifle, sword, and spear, but all but 80 of the Italians died. Alula's soldiers begged him to follow up his success at Dogali with a march on Masawa. Alula hesitated, then decided to withdraw. In Italy, shock was followed by speeches, prayer vigils, and memorial masses. There was a myth building too, centered round an unconfirmed report that the final victims at Dagali had abruptly stopped fighting and stood at attention, presenting arms in final salute to the fallen, whom they soon joined. Reconstructions of this patriotic tableau appeared in engravings in cheap prints and cut into sapphire jewelry. Improbably, Dagali was compared to Thermopylae, where King Leopold Leonidas and 300 Spartans died in combat against an invading, invading Persian force. Colonel de Christophorus, the Italian commanding officer, was the new Leonidas. It seemed not to have occurred to anyone that Alula and his men were the defenders and that the 500 Italians more closely fit the Persian role of invaders. In Rome, there were calls for a monument in the Italian capital to honor 500 dead, the Cinco Cento. The piazza in front of the train station was chosen for the memorial site and renamed in their honor. The architect of the Degali monument rescued an Egyptian obelisk unearthed near the station and it made it the focus of this monument. The obelisk was an inspired choice. It had been hauled back in triumph to the imperial Rome of antiquity. 
On the Dagali monument, it suggested continuity between old Rome and the new Rome being born. The obelisk sat on a plinth on which the names of the 500 were inscribed. The dedication of the monument at the Piazza dei Cinquecento took place on 5th of June. It became the site of annual ceremonies of remembrance, which also served to stoke the fires of imperial ambition. Italy sought to use the massacre at Dagali as a means to press expansionist claims. If nothing else, the 500 dead could be traded for territorial compensation. Johannes was in no mood to be generous. The Galli had her to standing among Europeans, who saw it as ungentlemanly, an African little bighorn. Johannes had virtually no leverage on European public opinion, and now he was being cast in the role of savage and ruthless pre predator. He protested by letter to Queen Victoria, that Dugali never would have happened if the Hewitt Treaty had been respected. Quote, a man came from the Italians as a friend, unquote, he wrote, writing, quote, writing affectionate letters and bearing some presents to spy out my own country. But when he came where the Egyptians had been, he said, we shall occupy this. Then I said, what have you to do with my own country? Johannes had done what any patriot would have done. Johannes backed Alula, who after Dagali was subject to sharp criticism. Although Alula had m more soldiers than the Italians, Alula had ambushed them, surrounded them, massacred them. Johannes refused to make an example of Alula. As Johannes explained to Victoria, Alula had done no wrong. <clears throat> Quote, they came by force and made in two places forts. Ras Alula was down to inquire, what business have you to do with other people's country? Unquote. It could hardly be stated more clearly. The Gali was a leg legitimate response to a blatant act of trespass. It was an act of defense. Still, Italy pressed for compensation. Sir John Saville, writing to London from Rome, offered a brutally honest appraisal of the Italian op Italian position. If negotiations for compensation broke down, Italy threatened to send an army of more than 20,000 in pursuit of Alula, but Seville wondered to what end. Ras Alula, Seville noted, quote, is not likely to wait quietly the lesson the Italians wish to give him. They may be compelled to follow him into the interior, where it will be easy to prepare against them surprises like that of the Gali, unquote. And even if they managed to push, punish Alula, what would Italy have accomplished? Seville noted that Italy was also using the promise of trade with Ethiopia to cover a policy of expansion. Italy, Seville noted skeptically, quote, spoke of opening an expanded Italian frontier to Abyssinian produce, but what does Abyssinia produce? A few hundred kilograms of coffee exchange for a few bales of calico, which certainly not enrich Italy. The only way to make money was by selling arms to Ethiopia, a trade Italy was unlikely to encourage. Moreover, Seville rightly noted that Italian public opinion was hardly keen on the idea of Italian expansion into Africa, with tepid public support dim commercial prospects and dauntingly military challenges, what was the point? Britain dispatched Gerald Porto from Her Majesty's legation at Cairo to patch things up. Britain wanted to keep expectations modest. A memo candidly described Porto as of no very high rank. Portal was perfectly calibrated to his task. This Ethan educated gentleman had joined the diplomatic corps at 21 and was posted to Egypt three years later. He was still in his 20s when he, went, he was sent to Ethiopia. Not only was it his first mission to, of consequence, it was the very first he would lead. 
Portal was tall, fair, and well-groomed. His full waxed mustache curved up at the ends. He wore his hair parted in the middle so that it repeated the line of his mustache, dipping slightly as it crossed his brow on either side. Portal approached his mission partly as duty, partly as exotic voyage. He took careful notes of his journey. Later, he would publish his story in a volume that would feed the voracious Victorian appetite for adventure stories drawn from real life. Portal's diplomatic mission got off to a rocky start, particularly since Johannes, following the unraveling of the Hewitt Treaty, had good reason to mistrust British intentions. The Ethiopians saw Portal and the British more broadly, not as honest brokers, but as a mouthpiece for Italian reparation demands for after Dogali. A letter sent to Johannes over Victoria's signature claimed that Italian moves toward the Ethiopian highlands were intended merely for the protection of caravans and pointedly argued that Ras Alula had attacked unjustly. Porto arrived at Masawa in October 1887. He carried a summary of the Italian position, which insisted on territorial compensation, including Dogali, Sahati, and more lands that, according to the Italians, had never been recognized as Abyssinian. As the road to Johannes led through Ras Alula, Portal made their journey into the highlands as Asmara, where Portal found the legendary fighter. Alula was one of the great patriots of Ethiopian history. A rare photo shows a slender man of medium height with a round head, hooded eyes, and full face. The young Alula stands among his men, bareheaded but otherwise decked out in military regalia, silk tunic over cotton pants, and a lion skin draped over his shoulders and tied at the chest. His shield was richly decorated in silver. He held a rifle in his right hand. So it's the the um, rear picture it talks about is this this one. He's He's the one in the center. Yeah. Augustus Wilde, a British Red Sea diplomat, journalist, and author, was among Alula's earliest and most ardent admirers. Wilde's admiration at least on a superficial level, amounted to an act of assimilation to European standards. For Wilde, Alula was, quote, more like a brown Englishman than anything else. He was, quote, very good looking, with good eyes, well-shaped nose, and very white and perfect teeth, and had short, black, wavy hair, unquote. Wilde's appreciation went well beyond his looks. Lula was charming, a fine storyteller with a keen sense of humor and broad-minded views. Lula's vision was inclusive. His inner circle included both Muslims and Christians. Wilde and Alula would remain good friends until Alula's untimely death a few months after the Battle of Adwa. But Portal was not wild. Alula was no mood to charm. He could see no good coming from Portal's mission, which he saw as, at best, an attempt to paper over British treachery following the Hewitt Treaty. At worst, Portal was an agent of Italian interests. The audience took place at Alula's compound at Asmara. Alula's main building was a circular hut, 45 feet in diameter. Massive posts supported the conical roof of branch and straw. At the top of the roof was a red wooden cross topped by an orb, good for warding off the evil eye. Portal stooped as he entered, but as the room was illuminated by only two doors, he saw nothing at first. 
When his eyes adjusted, he could discern the outlines of a formidable reception. Ras Alula sat cross-legged on a divan draped in red cotton, flanked and backed by a court of no fewer than seventy people. Along the walls were animal horns from which weapons and shields were hanging. Portal had prepared for his meeting by dressing in full diplomatic attire. Like Portal, Alula dressed to impress. He had draped himself in purple silk with gold embroidery. A Martini Henry rifle sat within reach, as did a curved sword, but Portal was most deeply impressed by Alula's face. Portal noted that Alula was darker than most men in Tigray. He was transfixed by Alula's bright hazel eyes and gleaming teeth, which he recalled in language that smacked of the exotic and feral. Quote, I had seen such eyes in the head of a tiger and of a leopard, unquote. he noted, quote, but never in that of a human being, unquote. Where Wilde had seen an Englishman, Portal saw trouble. Portal observed the diplomatic custom of gift exchange by setting out a gift-boxed Winchester repeating rifle, a clear step up from Alula's Martini Henry, and 500 rounds of ammunition just to get him started. Alula feigned indifference. Although Portal's mission was to negotiate peace with Johannes, Alula wanted to do everything in his power to undermine it. There could be no peace that did not repudiate Alula and his actions at Dugali. As for the Italian claim on compensation, Alula's message was emphatic, presuming to speak for Johannes, and thus, on behalf of Ethiopia, there could be no occupation of Sahati outside of the quid pro quo that, quote, the Italians should come to Sahati only if Alula could go as governor to Rome, unquote. After this first interview, Alula detained Portal as a virtual prisoner for 10 days, which Portal feared might be his last. Alula knew better than to harm Portal, but he was deadly serious about detaining him. Peace could be impossible if Portal never reached Johannes. In due course, Alula received a message that he must allow Portal to proceed. Portal prepared to meet Johannes at Lake Ashange as the Ethiopian emperor and his army moved northward in early December. Portal and his group took up a position by the side of the road and watched for four hours as the army went by. His account of the experience is instructive. Quote, Beach and I made a most careful calculation of the numbers of persons who marched past us that morning, counting first the numbers who passed a certain spot in a minute, and then taking the time in which the whole army passed at a very low estimate, we calculated the numbers to be no less than between 70,000 and 80,000 persons. About the middle of the throng rode the king himself, surrounded by a picked body of cavalry. He was mounted on a handsome mule and was dressed in the usual Abyssinian red and white shama or toga, a fold of which concealed all the lower part of his face, the only distinguishing mark of royalty being the fact that he kept the rays of the sun from his august head with a red silk umbrella. Unquote. Not only was it not only was it was Portal's first glimpse of Johannes, but it was his first glimpse of an Ethiopian army at full strength. It left him with no illusions about Johannes's intention to fight. At their meeting, Portal presented a Winchester rifle and a very large telescope, quote, suitable equally for astronomical and territorial purposes, terrestrial purposes. Portal's gift from, from Johannes was a complete Ethiopian outfit, a pink embroidered undershirt, an embroidered shama, for fine cotton, a lion's mane stole 
to drape over his shoulders with lion hind and forelegs pine, pinned so as to drape down the front and back. Sword and scabbard were attached in the Ethiopian manner to the right hip and shield completed the armament. The outfit was so impressive that upon his return to Cairo, Portal went immediately to a photographer's studio for a portrait in full Ethiopian regalia. P peace negotiations were poorly, went poorly. I am the aggrieved, Johannes observed. Why then should I be punished? By December, Portal was back in Masawa, his mission in tatters. Meanwhile, Johannes marched his army as far as Ginda, on the road from Asmara to Masawa and mere hours from Italian positions as Sahati. As Johannes prepared to settle with the Italians once and for all, he learned that the Mahdi had invaded the western provinces of his empire. Tekla Haimanot, the king of Goja, had been defeated on January 21st, 1888. Mahdist's forces had marched on Gonda, an ancient Egyptian capital, and torched much of the city, including dozens of churches. Against the advice of Alula, who insisted on a showdown with the Italians, Johannes wheeled, taking his army and Alula with him. By April 1888, not only Sahati, but Asmara itself had been evacuated. The Italians were preparing another challenge for Johannes. At about the time that Ras Alula was entering Gerald Portal in Asmara, Italian agents were in the south at Addis Ababa, wing, wooing Menelik with the promises of farms and a tacit alliance against Johannes in exchange for land in the north and a special relationship with Italy. Menelik, for his part, courted the Italians by observing that while avenging the Gali would cost Italy millions, he himself might be useful in that regard. A gift of rifles and cartridges could easily do that job. For different but complementary reasons, Menelik and the Italians were hoping that Johannes would stumble and fall. They would soon get their wish. Menelik, as king of Shoa, offered Johannes only a provisional loyalty. He aimed to replace Johannes as emperor of Ethiopia at the first opportunity, at the death of Johannes if need be, sooner if possible. Johannes harbored no illusions about Menelik. In the 1870s, he had to move military, militarily against Menelik to impose his authority. Since then, he had enjoyed only grudging respect from Menelik. When Johannes mobilized in the north against the encroaching Italians, he had to worry about Menelik at his back in the south. The Italians, for their part, harnessed their own ambitions to those of Menelik. One day, Menelik would replace Johannes, putting a compliant friend of Italy on the imperial throne. Augustus Wilde, a friend of Ethiopia with a strong moralizing streak, had no kind words for Menelik. For Wilde, Menelik was an intriguer who would stop at nothing to topple Johannes. All of this was no doubt true, but the question was not whether Menelik could be paid, but whether he could be bought. It was a distinction the Italians were about to learn. With the vengeful Italians in the north and a slippery Menelik to the south, Johannes opted first to go west and take on the Mahdi. Augustus Wilde long afterwards suspected Menelik of colluding with the Mahdists, pushing them to attack Ethiopia and Johannes, a charge tantamount to treason. At first the fighting went well for Johannes and his army, but then a Mahdist rifle rounded wounded Johannes in the abdomen. The loss of Johannes took the fight out of the Ethiopian army. A circle of followers rallied around the dying Johannes, defending his body in retreat. The Mahdi's soldiers caught up with them the following day. They seized the emperor's cor corpse and took the head of Johannes as a trophy. It was displayed in Khartoum atop a pike. Who would succeed the unfortunate Johannes? 
as he lay dying, Johannes recognized Mangasha as his son and heir. His dying gesture gave Mangasha a claim on the imperial crown. Now he would have to earn it. End of chapter 3. Chapter 4 I will read at a later time or date. Thank you for watching.